3G in Australia is dead. But, well, what happens now? See, I made a video a few months back covering the impending demise of 3G in Australia. And I tried to cover off the broad basis of what people needed to know, what I thought they needed to know. But there were some areas and some topics I didn't cover. I've had some feedback. And I'd just like to address those fairly quickly, fairly simply, as best as I am able. So let's get into it with question number one. Is 3G really dead this time? So amongst the responses I got to my video was this little number. Why are you lying to your viewers? 3G is still working, so is 2G, and slow 2G, why lie about something so easily debunked? And, uh, look, I mean, in one sense, yes, fine, classic internet troll. But also, thanks, random internet person. Why thanks? Because, well, this is so easy to cover off, really. This is an easy question to answer. And the answer is, no, I'm not lying, they're gone. And as per Telstra's statement around its closure plans, as I'm recording this on the 4th of November, 2024, all of their 3G networks were to be shut down. That was the time frame they gave from when they were going to start shutting them down, which they did in Tasmania, to when they planned to have them closed nationwide, 4th of November, when I'm recording this. But hey, I'm just some guy on the internet. Maybe you do think I'm lying. Well, that's fine. I've put links in the description below to Telstra and Optus and Vodafone statements on their 3G network closures. Feel free, as they say, to do your own research, click on those, and you will find that 3G is, in fact, gone. It's gone. And yeah, I know, I probably shouldn't waste my time responding to the internet trolls like that, but I really just don't want someone to... Read that, think, oh yeah, 3G's still around, Alex is lying, and then make a bad, or in this case, non-existent call as a result. So do 3G areas now have no coverage at all? Well, look, as per the network telcos, and to reiterate, I'm not a telco, I don't work for the telcos, I'm just a journalist, but as per the telcos, the reason why the 3G shutdown wasn't just a matter of flicker switch in headquarters and laugh evilly kind of affair, was the exact reason why they were shutting them down in the first place, which was to switch that 3G coverage over to 4G coverage. So the promise here was that 3G areas would see 4G network replacements. In some cases, because of the nature of the way 4G networks work, you might actually see improved performance. It's a better technology. It can go a little further, a little faster. That was the promise, of course. Now, the reality is going to be variable. There's just no question about that. But I think we've all experienced this. We've all had that point where a call goes really well at one spot one time, and then the next time you're kind of struggling to get through. Radio waves are variable. And I'm certain there will be some areas that will have some black spot problems or some coverage issues. I, I don't feel like this is going to be a flawless transition. It'll be interesting to see what happens. And I think the critical thing here really is how quickly the telcos act if there is an identified area where the closure of 3G has not been covered by 4G network coverage, where it's demonstrable that that's the problem that someone's having or that a group of people is having because that's what will really matter. We will have to wait and see on that score. What's all this about telcos blocking phones from getting any service at all? So this was a late development, which is why I didn't cover it in my initial video, because it hadn't happened yet. If you have a phone, including some newer models purchased overseas or as refurb units bought in Australia, more on those cases shortly, that can't access triple zero services over 4G LTE networks because they default to 3G only, then Australian telcos won't permit you on their networks. They're not just stopping you from accessing triple zero calls. They will not provide service to you at all. Now, they're not being specifically petty against you personally. Well, maybe you, Susan, you know what you did. What they're actually doing is they're stopping providing service because they're not legally allowed to. And that's a situation that developed fairly late in the timeline of Optus and Telstra shutting down their 3G networks. As a reminder, Vodafone TPG shuttered their 3G much earlier this year. The ACMA announced new rules. If you care, it's the Telecommunications Emergency Call Service Amendment Determination 2024 number one. I'll leave a link in the description below for those who like reading Acts of Parliament, that in essence stops telcos from being able to provide services to customers with phones that cannot make triple zero calls. Specifically, as per the ACMA, the new rules require telcos to identify mobile phones unable to access the emergency call service, that's triple zero, 
notified customers with mobile phones unable to access the emergency call service. And this is the critical bit, not supply carriage services, that's telco services, that's phone service, to mobile phones unable to access the emergency call service. They're just simply not allowed to. Now, the intent here is pretty clear. The ACMA doesn't want people thinking that they can make triple zero emergency calls, get into emergencies, and then discover at the worst possible time that they can't. However, the timing of when they announced this was, in my personal view, not great. While the telcos don't actually have a choice but to comply, and there has been some fairly persistent messaging around the need to switch out 3G phones, the subtleties of which 4G capable phones could make triple zero calls was a lot harder for consumers to determine and giving people very little time before suddenly making them aware that not only could they perhaps lose access to triple zero, but in fact lose access altogether was not good. Now, for what it's worth, those devices aren't actually blocked from accessing, say, Wi-Fi in any way. So they could be fair at home devices for video calling, apps, and you know whatever else they run for as long as they last. But they won't be able to get Australian telco services because that's the law. You said it was only old phones that would lose access. Mine is quite new. So this is the other emerging factor. Although it's tricky to work out the precise number of devices affected by this scenario. And in fact, it's a couple of scenarios. As I said, there's essentially two camps of people facing this issue. Firstly, there's those who have explicitly purchased overseas models, either as grey imports or while they were personally overseas. And sometimes that might have been just because the phone they wanted was cheaper in, say, Hong Kong, or it may have been a model that was never actually sold here. And the scenario there is mostly that they lack the precise band and fallback support that Australian produced models of those phones, if available, had, so they can no longer access those triple zero services, so as per the ACMA's ruling, they are blocked. Now, buying tech overseas can have its benefits absolutely in terms of price and sometimes earlier access if a device hasn't launched here yet. Hi, for example, Steam Deck owners up until very, very recently. But it does also have its risks, although those have historically more been around things like warranty coverage more so than actual usage. And I totally get the frustration of those buyers, because in some cases, it does appear that it's an issue of telcos not particularly being willing to whitelist and approve devices that might be functionally capable of 4G LTE fallback, although maybe not in every case. And it's very unclear to me, I'm going to chase the telcos up about this, what happens to tourists roaming in Australia if they've got those devices? It's an interesting question that I have not seen good answers to as yet. Stay tuned. For the grey market buyers, you may also have a case under Australian consumer law here to get a refund if you purchased from an Australian company. Although I'm not a lawyer, that's not legal advice. That's just the way I see the situation. Australian consumer law may protect you in this case because a device has become non-functional through no fault of your own. But to a certain extent, I also personally feel if you are importing, you are taking certain chances. And I think some people are aware of this, some people will not want to accept that, and that's fine too, we can disagree. I think the uglier side of this, I think the side that hits people a little bit more unfairly, are the folks who purchased refurbished phones through Australian retailers that appeared to be local models. I mean, isn't every iPhone just an iPhone? Spoiler here, no, no it's not. Even Apple, who loves a uniform approach to design of their products because it's frankly just more profitable for them, produces dozens of models of every iPhone to suit different telco markets. And where this gets ugly for Australian buyers of refurbished phones is that a refurbished phone may have been built on the chassis of an imported phone, but it could get sold to a retailer in a batch with a bunch of refurbished Australian phones. The retailer doesn't really know the difference, can't really see the difference. You've actually got to look at the model numbers to work out, ah, oh, that's the US model, that's the Australian model, that's the Chinese model, and so on and so forth. And so nobody down the chain has really been aware of anything other than, I have this iPhone here that I'd like to sell to you cheap. Somebody buys the iPhone, they think, great, it's new or new to me. It's new-ish in terms of its lineage, a couple of years old maybe. But then the 3G network shutdown happens, the ACMA steps in, and they're suddenly told, hey, by the way, your phone doesn't work anymore, even though a phone sold right next to it may well have done just fine. It's a real mess. And in at least one case, as per an ABC article that I'll link below, 
consumers are being offered refunds by at least one retailer. So that's definitely something I'd chase up if you find yourself in this situation. Go back to the retailer that sold you the phone and state, right, I've been informed that this is no longer a functional phone and I would like a refund. My view, again, not legal advice, I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a journalist, would be that you should have a case to get a refund there. And frankly, if that is you, I hope that you are able to get that. Now, I know this won't have answered everyone's questions to everyone's satisfaction, so if you do have any other comments, leave them below, but hopefully that's cleared up some of the other lingering issues. Thanks for watching.